Welcome to SelfDiscoveryWisdom.com, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. On these podcasts, you're going to hear people who speak from the heart. They've taken the journey in life. Many things have happened to them, but they've changed it to happening for them. And in their strength, their courage, they've discovered their abilities and their wisdom, and they are now sharing it here with you. Do enjoy each show. We bring it to you with love and knowing that it's going to help you on your journey of life. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to our veteran stories right here on Self Discovery Wisdom, formerly known as Self Discovery Media. This is our week of rebranding, so it is a brand new name. But the topic of veterans isn't always brand new, but the approach to how we're going to look at it today is, I'm your host, Sarah Troy. My uh, my guest, James Felion, is uh, an author. He's written some beautiful books. And his whole perspective around veterans, the angels that were the first American boots on the ground in Japan, yet their bravery is unknown to so many. He likes to bring those angels and the people that made the sacrifice to light, the people that have been forgotten. He... Um, a WW second, World War Second paratrooper finally gets uh, his due for the masterful storytelling of paratrooper James. And the angels that were the first boots on the ground in Japan, their bravery is unknown. Um, so he's published the diaries of Angels in the Sun, which unveils the unparalleled soldier's perspective of the angels' unique flight against Japanese army and forces of nature to free the Philippines and it is a story of the World War II enthusiasts this must read, but I also think it's a story that our children need to read, because if they understand the sacrifices of those that were made before for their liberty and freedom today, maybe they wouldn't be quite so complacent uh, as they have become. So James is a paratrooper turned historian. He served in the U.S. Army for more than a decade and a uh, graduate of the U.S. Army Airborne jump master and pathfinder schools his previous book the four hours of fury the untold story of world war ii's largest airborne invasion and the final push into nazi germany germany is uh, widely praised and we'll touch on that uh, book as well um he has written the World War II magazine, um, Military History and other outlets, and has served as a technical advisor on the World War II documentaries, the Illuminous uh, University of Texas, and his wife um, lives in, and they live in Texas Hill County. Um, his approach to looking at this isn't to glorify a war or to glorify the um, the way that we look at war, but to actually celebrate the people that were out there making that sacrifice that up against all odds. My father was a squadron leader in the war. Um, he had to guide those bombers to safety. Um, he picked up spies at night <laughs> to get them home and apparently came home more than once with his tail on fire. So we look at these people as heroic when we look at them in the movies and we think, wow, this is awesome. But what about the heroes that did it in real life? Most of the time, they're extremely humble. They come back to their life and they try and live normally, not always achievable, um, but they don't look at themselves as heroes. They were just doing what they were meant to do. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate the invitation. It's it's a difficult one, isn't it, when we look at, um, I mean, you know, why do we have war? Why can't we get along? And why can't we actually talk it out? You know, it's, you know, it's this attitude that the, you know, the weapons have got to come out and strut each other's stuff. I, my weapon's bigger than yours and bum, 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 bum. But it, it is happening because that's the way man is until man decides to change. Um, but the people that are the, the hidden secrets that we don't really see much of, you know, Top Gun, really grand, you know, showing some heroic stuff and all of that. But paratroopers especially, you know, you're going into unknown territory. Uh, is the, is the para, parachute going to open up? Are you going to land in a tree? Are you going to be shot down on your way down? Uh, you don't always quite know what's waiting for you. Um, it is the anticipation, I imagine, from the moment you jump out of that plane till you land on the ground must be extremely high. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's where, you know, you, you've described what I think is the very popular conception and the accurate description of, of jumping out of an airplane. Um, and then when you add into that the examples that we're talking about today of jumping into combat, mm. you know, most people tend to focus on jumping out of the plane, which, you know, 
from a experience perspective, some of us have done, most of us have not. <laughs> so it's natural that people kind of look towards that. But it's also in, in the context of what we're talking about today, just the commute to work for these guys, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, to your point, it's there are concerns with the parachute going to malfunction. Are they waiting for us when we jump out? Are they going to shoot us down? But then you've got to, once you land, then you've got to go do the job. And so yes. that's kind of where the, their mindset has to be. It's certainly those those anxieties are present when it's happening, but it also has to be dismissed very quickly as they then roll up their parachute, gather with their comrades and and head off to actually accomplish what they dropped in, in to do. Uh, it can, as I imagine, my mother was a stage actress and she said, you know, always the butterfly nerves before you got on, but they were the adrenaline that mm -hmm. made her give the best performance. So, you know, that anxiety, jumping out of the plane, will I land all the blah, 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 that goes through the head? I'm sure it becomes part of the adrenaline to be very, very focused on what you need to do when you land. Exactly. And I think that's where, you know, you see, you know, the, the, the training is, is so important, right? So that you minimize that adrenaline spike, because as I'm sure you know, adrenaline spikes then cause you to be exhausted thereafter. Yes. Your, 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 your body has turned on for, you know, the fight or flight mode to oversimplify it there. But, but so the training aspect of it was important because you want that commute part that I mm -hmm. described to, to kind of almost be second nature. Now, there's always going to be a little bit of that trepidation around just the natural act of jumping from an airplane in flight. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one of those things, the more you can get exposed to it, ideally, the more uh, in the flow you are, so to speak, so that your your adrenaline is then saved for what you're actually doing once you, know, once you land. Mm. And of course, you're relying, you know, on the equipment being right, you know, um, the Somebody hasn't sabotaged it, which we see in the movies, and you know right. all sorts of things that are, that are going on. And then, as you said, it's the commute. It's the commute to work, and then you know uh, what they have to do on the ground. And it doesn't matter how much intelligence they have; you know, it's still unknown because the intelligence has sprinkled us, doesn't it? We think, you know, we're, we think they're over there. We think this. We think that you've got to go in and do this, but basically, you're walking into the unknown. Absolutely right. I think that's the, the the perfect way to look at it because, again, I think you know the movies kind of tend to lead lead us on, and and our own experience of looking back in hindsight makes it appear that the Allies were inevitably going to win World War II. Mm -hmm. Right? That wasn't necessarily the feeling in the world in 1941 and 1942 mm -hmm. when the outcome of the war was, you know, up for grabs. We could say. Um, and the important thing to remember is, is even if, even if you went into it in in late in the war, when the certainty of it was, the overall certainty of it was perhaps more confidence was that we were going to win the war. That doesn't mean that you were going to make it through that day, right? Yes. And I think that's another thing that we kind of lose. And, and one of the reasons why I try to write these books from a narrative perspective is that it's important to recognize intelligence always isn't correct right and the and the enemy always gets a vote and yeah. sometimes that's where we get you know very sad tragedies if things don't go according to plan um and people don't don't make it through the day it's the moment by moment isn't it i mean we that's we right. certainly have become a society that's looking at the destination i want to get to the destination yeah. full throttle go there but they don't understand it's the journey that counts and right. you know, the the steps they take to whatever destination they're they're there to do, pull someone out, do something, whatever their job is, um, the journey is a really important one because it's not only the safety, but it's the assessment of what's going on. But it's mm -hmm. also how are they going to get back? Yeah, that's right. Well, I think one, you know, you brought up an interesting point about the the destination and the immediacy of it. And it, it struck me as one of the you know, as a historian, you're, I'm always trying to figure out, okay, well, what date did that happen on? What, what was that a Wednesday or a Thursday? What, you know, how, how does it all fit together? And one of the veterans uh, made a comment, you know, there, there was no Tuesday or Wednesday for us. There was yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and that's it. Yeah. Um, because they, you know, especially, you know, when we talk about the, the guys that were in the Philippines in the middle of the jungle, mm -hmm. um, they didn't have calendars. They didn't have an iPhone to tell them what day it was. It right. was um, very much focused on the immediacy of my next meal, my next, you know, hill that we have to take repeat. 
you know, and hopefully yeah. somewhere in there you're getting some sleep and things it, like that. Is it safe to take a nap? Is it safe to stop to eat? Is it safe to go to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah. You know, all those common things that we do as human beings. And they're in probably, obviously, in weather conditions they're not used to, right? Humidity, et cetera. And they don't know the jungle. And of course, you know, again, in the movies, they've got the satellites, they've got this, they've got that gadget, and they can see people walking. Uh, you're talking about World War II, where there wasn't any of that. It literally was, right. you know, in, instinct had to be very much on the ball, didn't it? Instinct, and I think, you know, to, to the points that you mentioned specifically about when, you know, let's just use taking a nap or getting some shut-eye as an example. I mean, I think in the, the war against Japan specifically, that very much came down to trusting the person next to you, mm. right? So this idea of, you know, the Japanese very much had this mystique of, you know, these very stealthy jungle fighters that could emerge from anywhere at any time. You had to be on your toes. And so the way that you actually can, can the only way you could really function against that kind of, of fear is knowing that your buddy is going to be watching the jungle while you're taking a nap or eating or, or whatever it is that you've got to do, right? And so that that builds this inherent comradeship and friendship that you know, is another thing that's kind of foreign to those of us who haven't had to rely on yeah. somebody in a literal life or death situation. Like if I'm asleep and then you fall asleep and we're both asleep in our foxhole, we got a problem. Mm. Yes. Right. And so there's got to be uh, there's got to be that trust and and that uh, that. But and we've also got to understand that at some point sleep deprivation is going to is you know set in there and uh you know especially if it's in weather conditions that are more draining you know the body is getting more exhausted but um you know having done a lot of shows with veterans you know one of the problems was in coming home was they were so used to a brotherhood where they were an extension of each other Mm -hmm. They were, you know, in their unit, they were one and they were like a well oiled machine. They knew each their part and how to work together. And then they come home and they don't have that at home. You know, they may have a, a spouse and kids and a community, but they're not the same people that went in the first place. They've come back. They're different. They're, they don't have that same kind of camaraderie. It's very, very different. And how do they integrate back in? because there, there isn't that same reliance. It's life or death, that reliance out there. But when they come back, it's a different scenario, and very hard to adapt to. Yes, agreed. And that's where, you know, I think you find that, and especially if we look at, you know, some of the, the more recent veteran communities around Iraq and Afghanistan and things mm. where we've had a better chance for candid conversations with those veterans, I think you see that in, you know, there's the, 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 the common concept of, you know, my war gone by, I miss it. So type of mm -hmm. thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you start to peel away at that, it's, it's, it's that dichotomy of, well, I don't really miss the war and the yeah. hardship of the things that occurred with that, but I miss having a sense of purpose. I miss being part of something bigger than me. I miss that that camaraderie. And I, yeah. I use that word distinctly over friendship because yeah. I think it's something deeper and bigger. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the 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 bond between them, you know, because it's so life and death, it really goes very deep, deep rooted. Um, and also, let's face it, they're the only ones that truly understand what they've gone through. And they can come back and tell their stories. But to everyone, it's, it's a story. They don't actually understand the real feeling behind it. So, you know, it, they sometimes can feel, are you hearing me? Yeah. Right. Well, I think too, there's a, there's a fear of, of judgment. I think, mm. you know, uh, this part, you know, reminds me of a story um, in the Philippines where a small element of, of the guys that I was writing about was about to get overrun by uh, a Japanese bonsai attack. And one of the medics, overdosed one of his patients with morphine oh because they didn't want him you know they didn't want him to fall into the hands of the right the japanese they weren't in a position to be able to carry him out and so you get you know you, you think about a situation like that yeah, the guilt the guilt yeah. well and you're not going to want to talk to anybody about no. that who wouldn't potentially understand right because right. you're you, we're all going to approach it from this perspective of like well are you really sure you couldn't have carried yeah. him out you know, and you don't have that 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 fear. You don't have that context 
to process a story like that. Well, I mean, somebody who's injured in the hands of the Japanese that we know from the war, um, it would have been a death sentence anyway, but they would have tortured him first. That's right. So basically, just like an animal that's in pain or at the end of its days, we give it grace and yeah. give it an exit. So, But again, as you said, unless you're there in that situation, people just don't understand it. And the person who is um, wounded and knows that, that somebody else carrying them out is going to detriment to everybody. I mean, right. that's something we forget, you know, with our, with our police force, with our, our fire um, people, uh, with our, you know, first responders. I mean, never mind the mental strain that goes on, you mm -hmm. know, the build up over the years, but the, the, how they put their lives on, on the line all the time and how, again, they rely on each other. And is right. that until you are a person that's on that forefront facing what they have to face, we're not going to understand and they don't particularly want to talk about it because they compartmentalize it. Yeah, but they compartmentalize it. And I think even, you know, if we're talking about, you know, certainly in today's terms, mm. people are very comfortable making judgments and oh. you know, casting opinions on things that they uh, have no idea of. No idea what they're talking <laughs> yes. about. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, you know, we've, we've certainly got those people and, uh, you know, we, until, you know, I love the Don Ruse saying the four agreements, you know, speak a word with integrity. Uh, don't assume, ask. All right. Don't take things personally, uh, right. because I'm sure that, you know, when they come back, so many people, why don't you do this or do that? That You know, don't take it personally. That's their ignorance. Don't take it personally. And just do your best measured by what you know is your best, not somebody else's. And I think that they're mm -hmm. kind of codes that it doesn't matter what realm you're in, the good codes to live by. Otherwise, somebody's attack on you uh, when you get home, you could take very personally. Right. And and our ignorance of not asking how they feel with the circumstances or anything else, but assuming is an insult. Right. Agree 100%. Yeah, you can't really go into any of those circumstances with an assumption based on a lack of, you know, context or, or you know, you have to be very open to what you're going to hear because what you're going to hear may, may surprise you. <laughs> yeah. So, and it, you know, maybe yeah. uncomfortable. That's right. And unless you were there and knew the situation, you know, it's, um, you're going to have to accept what it is. And if it made you uncomfortable, we've put made you that uncomfortable. Don't ask in the first place, just respect and say, look, I don't want to know, but thank you for what you've done. Right. right? Uh, and if you do want to know, then open up your ears, your heart, and your sensibility and truly listen, listen to mm -hmm. learn, not to respond. You're right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that, that kind of fits in with the whole reason why I want to write these books is to mm -hmm. provide those additional, that additional context and share some of these stories that veterans have only shared amongst themselves and, yeah. and bring that awareness. Yeah. I've always been moved so much, you know, by what, who they are, what they're doing today, you know, and, what they've gone through, you know, and what they're still going through, you know, post-traumatic stress is very much alive, mm -hmm. but it's, it, they tackle it like they would if it was a mission. Right? right. And, and of course, structure is inc so incredibly important in order for their equilibrium. You know, that purpose you were talking about having mm -hmm. that purpose, which is very important. So why the, um, why the Philippine story, why this particular angel story that moved you so much to want to, yeah, so it. I think, um, you know, when we look at World War II, I think there's a certain, uh, there's a certain, there's certain aspects of, of World War II that we're all familiar with, right? We're kind of mm. all familiar with the flag raising at Iwo Jima. We're familiar with D-Day um, in Normandy, France. If you go a little bit deeper, maybe you're, you, maybe you've watched the Band of Brothers miniseries. Mm. Very good. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, very good. One of my, yeah, one of my favorites. Um, and so this group, this group, uh, this unit in particular, the 11th Airborne Division was very similar to the Band of Brothers, mm -hmm. but they were sent to the Pacific Theater. And then from an American perspective, when you think of the Pacific Theater, you typically think of the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of these stories. This is an Army unit, not a Marine unit. And I kind of want my with my background of being a former paratrooper, I'm kind of drawn to those 
stories and those those guys, um, frankly. And so this was a story that I wanted to tell about this unit that, um, you know, I kind of describe it as punching above their weight. You know, there was a mm-hmm. small unit. There was um, an, a, an airborne division was only 8,000 guys compared to 15,000 of a, of a regular unit. So they were, you know, they had to be much more self-reliant. Um, they were often overlooked um, from a, you know, deployment perspective because they were such a smaller unit and they had, they didn't have the logistical support inherent mm-hmm. on a lot of the other, uh, the a lot of the other units had. And then ultimately, though, to your point about them landing in Japan, that was kind of ultimately what played in their favor because they were more familiar with airlift and they could do more things with aircraft. And so that kind of lent them to uh, being the first troops to land um, via air in Japan at the end of the war, um, technically speaking, before the surrender was actually formalized. Mm. So why this particular story, you know, of the the angels against the sun? It's a great title. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, that title, explain it more, you know. Sure. Yeah. So the so the 11th Airborne Division, their nickname was the Angels. Mm -hmm. And the way they kind of got that uh, that nickname was, uh, you know, you have to remember at this time, you know, the vast majority of the U.S. Army, like most of the armies during World War Two were conscripted. Right. They weren't volunteers. Certainly there were Mm -hmm. volunteers, but a lot of them were drafted into the service. And so, you know, providing leadership to uh, massive groups of people, teenagers, young 20s, who don't necessarily want to be there or are interested to be there, but aren't really interested in dealing with, you know, the bureaucracy of the of the army, um, don't really enjoy having their freedoms curtailed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, they tend to act out when they can or when they get bored and things Mm -hmm. like that. So the running the running joke every Monday morning um, for this unit was, hey, Sarah, how many of your angels are in jail this morning? Um, that happened over the weekend, right? Whether it be, you know, drunk and disorderly or just, you know, there was there was a couple of guys, one of my favorite stories about um, jumping on a train. And then when the train failed to stop, they just decided to disconnect the car themselves. And so there were, <laughs> there was all kinds of little shenanigans like that, that these guys got in, in trouble for. And so the angels kind of became the sarcastic mm-hmm. nickname to, you know, the question every morning of how many, how many of your angels are in jail? And it kind of stuck as the unit kind of traveled through when they were in New Guinea um, waiting to be deployed into combat, same kind of thing. Uh, you know, they're on a small island, very bored. And so they just started making a sport out of stealing things from other <laughs> units and, um, you know, exercising their right as, 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 as young people do to, to entertain themselves. And so exactly. that's kind of where, when we look at the the title, that's where the angel aspect comes from and then against the sun is is a reference uh to the imperial japanese army who of course use the rising sun as their uh as their symbol so angels against the sun just kind of seemed like a yeah very appropriate yeah i mean yeah you you, you know you're taking people coming out of school probably not gone into college yet this is their angst time this is the time where they've got so much you know i've come out of school i've got freedom you know and it is that i'm you know, I, I'm 68, but I can remember <laughs> <laughs> 40 years ago, what trouble I got into. And I can imagine, especially when you get a whole bunch of guys together, egging each other on. And as you said, bored, um, you know, not being able to move on with a career or going to college because, you know, they're in the war um, and uh, probably kind of, in a sense, a sense of freedom from the everyday school routine, etc. And before they get deployed, before they get into that rhythm and really actually, you know, before they actually actually get out there into action, it's still kind of fun and games, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, and it, uh, until they meet that first action and then they wake up. That's right. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, one of the one of my favorite stories that kind of speaks to that and I'll transition into the, the, the once that first bullet happens, you know, there was a there was a, mor- a, a mortar platoon, so about 30 guys who were responsible for mortars, who one weekend went out in Louisiana, and they all got their ears pierced. And when they showed up on that Monday morning, all the officers <laughs> pretended that they couldn't see the earrings because they didn't, they're like, how are we going to, you know, 
Like 32 <laughs> guys have gotten their ears pierced. So how are we going to handle this? Like if we, you know, if it's it's easy to handle if one guy gets his yeah. ear pierced or like three of them get their ear pierced, but they've all got their ear pierced. <laughs> so they went for like this, this week or so of like per- each group pretending that nobody had their ear pierced until they started to get infected. Oh, right. Because and of course then, they don't follow through. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Nobody's using peroxide to, to deal with their pierced ears. So, so, you know, there was that, just that sense of, of mischievousness. And even when, uh, you know, even when they got into combat, you know, there was a, a going back to that seat, sleep deprived mm-hmm. story, you know, there was these, these three guys that went through the entirety of the war sharing a foxhole and taking turns on watch, you know, like, okay, you're up two hours, I'm up two hours, you know, and it just rotates. Well, what they didn't know until like 20 years after the war at a reunion was that all three of them were routinely changing the time on the watch by like 15, 20 minutes to hand it to the next guy so that they could go, they could go back to sleep. And so there was just, you know, you talk about sleep deprived, you keep, you, you know, it's one of these moments where you fall asleep and then like, it feels like 30 minutes later you're being woken up again. It's because they kept playing with the watch. <laughs> Which actually is rather dangerous because, you know, the, they have to rather kind of learn to sleep standing up, so to speak, don't they? You know, yeah. you know, get that deep sleep, but the antennas are, are, are live for anything that's out there. And of course, that the body can only do that for such a, you know, for so long before it rebels and saying, I need a deeper sleep. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I can imagine that, uh, you know, I did watch the Band of Brothers. It was brilliant. And then uh, the other one, Ryan, Saving Private Ryan. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. That opening scene, that first 20 minutes of that opening scene where there's no holes barred. This is as gruesome as it got. You know, I think it became quite a shocker to a lot of people. Like, I want to go to war and I just want to shoot them. And they see that scene, right, where people just didn't have a chance just didn't have a chance it was the right. luck of the draw whether you got through it had nothing to do with who you were how rich or popular or how skilled you were it was just were you lucky enough not to get hit by the bullet and that in a lot of sense is kind of very often what war is about isn't it it's just are you lucky enough um i had a, a somebody on a couple of weeks ago who's uh, she has this young lady living with her now from um the Ukraine, who spent five weeks in in a basement area with people that were injured. She only had first aid, but she was trying to save people's lives. She couldn't save people's lives. And they would try and go out and get food, but they would just be mowed down. And mm. uh, and it was just horrific, you know, hearing the bombing and the bombardment and uh, and just people crying and dying all around her. And this is a young woman. And we forget that it isn't just the soldiers that are on the front line. They then got to come across the people that are in this suffering, mm-hmm. right? And it's like part of them is there to do a job and they've got to go and do it. But then part of it is they see this and the humanity strings get pulled, right? Yes. And and it's like the, the – the, I think that would be the most horrific. I have heard stories from people that have interviewed with that that is what got to them the most. As a soldier – even losing another soldier was hard, but seeing what people were going through and not being able to help them was just horrific. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the angels experienced that uh, significantly when they went into the city of Manila in the, in the Philippines and were part of the part of the American force pushing in through there to to expel the Japanese. You know, when the when the war started, and the Japanese invaded the Philippines and the Bataan and all that kind of stuff happened. You know, MacArthur and the Americans declared Manila an open city in order to avoid the bloodshed of an urban battle. Mm. Well, that did not happen, unfortunately, in 1945 when the Americans came back in. The Japanese did not leave the city. They opted to fight there in the middle of a capital city of mm. almost a million people. Right. And, um, you know, sadly, there were, I think, uh, estimates are, you know, 100,000 civilians were killed in in that fighting, which is just hard to comprehend. And, you, yeah. and you, you know, and to your point, there are lots of sad uh, stories of these veterans who saw civilians or the aftermath of, of massacres and in that helpless position of not being able mm-hmm. to help. Yeah. I mean, we look at what's going on with the Ukraine right now. It's a dirty war. 
there's no honor in it. There's no dignity in it. There's no de defending the homeland. It's pure greed, opulence, and ego. Um, right. And and it's a dirty war because you don't send bombs or drones to maternity homes, mm -hmm. you know, to obliterating civilians and call that defense. You, you just right. don't do it. And so, you know, there is kind of honor in war. Is there any honor in war? I mean, the honor comes in the people who are in the war that are fighting for that survival. And I can imagine that it's really, really hard when you see some of the atrocities that have been done for the soldiers not to kind of lose it and just want to obliterate everybody in their sight, you mm -hmm. know, who have done it. Because uh, how do you take uh, prisoners when you've just seen what they've done? Right? right, and then teach and treat them with dignity, uh, when you know what they've just gone and done to a bunch of civilians, and I can imagine that the mental anguish over that too must be very hard. Yeah, and then I think if you look at the you know the Pacific War specifically, you had the additional challenge of the Japanese didn't want to be taken prisoner, and so right. you had a whole other level there of where you know, they kind of set the terms of how that conflict unfolded. And unfortunately, you got a situation where even even wounded Japanese were approached with heavy skepticism around, is he really wounded? Does he have yeah. a grenade? What's yeah. going to happen? And so to your point, it's like, well, you know, I want to go home when this is over. So I'm just going to kill the guy because yeah. it's easier to do that than to take the gamble of him hurting me or hurting one of my friends. Um and that you saw all the time, you know, it was and they, you know, and it was interesting because uh, I don't know if interesting is the right word, but, you know, they had, uh, you know, intelligence officers were very keen to get prisoners because mm, they want so to they, do, yeah, because yeah. they want information. Right. Yes. And so there was this problem in the Pacific of, well, like no one's bringing prisoners in. Mm. And so they tried all these different techniques of like, well, you know, if you bring a prisoner in, we'll give you five days off if you bring a prisoner in we'll give you you know 120 dollars and um and so you know you get in these situations where these guys were then like at, at one point they were trying to shoot this japanese guy uh, in the leg so that they could wound him just enough to then bring him in as prisoner um and the guy ended up stabbing himself to death with his own bayonet rather right. than being yeah. being captured prisoner right so it was it was definitely a, a brutal situation regardless of what you were trying to do right if you right. try to do the right thing you still could find yourself in in very precarious yes situation. i mean it is you know people think it's it's all you know guns shooting the enemy and horror you know and it, it isn't that the, the i think the, the post-traumatic stress in coming back is in what they've seen on what they've had to do and mm -hmm. the fact that they've had to live so much in that adrenaline all the time. And, you know, basically a lot of it, they're still on guard. You know, they're still right. in, they're still very much in that sensitivity of things around them. And it's something that never goes away. You know, certain things trigger them and it will always trigger them. It doesn't matter how much work they do. It's there because it was so utterly instilled in them over yeah. there that even though it may diminish in a certain aspect but that it's still there and you know it's it's such a shame when we look at that because look what it does to our young men and women on the front line for the rest of their lives right yeah and i think you can then compound that with traumatic brain injury yes which is something that you know we're still obviously trying to get a better understanding of and what that looks like and we have much better technology now to be able to detect it because the symptoms to your to your what you described you know symptoms of traumatic brain injury are very similar to post-traumatic stress yeah um you know and in world war ii these guys were routinely sitting you know yards away from high-powered explosives going off that were causing the exact same kind of you know brain injuries that that we that we see today and those were going completely undiagnosed yeah um back back in the 40s yeah i remember there was one guy i interviewed he was a, a vietnam veteran and uh he was forced to go to vietnam he didn't want to and what he, um, his division did was kind of make roads you know, you know for for the military to go through and he said he was there one time and there was a young boy holding a grenade and 
it was his job to shoot the kid before the grenade was thrown. Mm -hmm. And he said at that time, I would have had to shoot him to protect the rest of us. But if I did, I would have turned the gun on myself for shooting mm -hmm. a child. Mm -hmm. And he said, fortunately, he didn't. The kid ran. But I mean, they use children right yeah. and and women and everything else uh, to sacrifice themselves which is again horrific you're meant to be defending your people not using your people right. Uh, right and so it's it's a nasty thing war but we at the same time evil happens in the world um you know ukraine didn't let's lay down and say come on in putin you can have what you want they're standing up and defending and they have a great leader a true example of a leader there that's with their people he's right there on the front he's not cowardly hiding behind somewhere and it's fighting a war because they are trying to to, to save their country and their way of life and i understand that um it's sad that we have to do that but they have um i think there's 22 percent to women in the ukraine war that are that decided to stay and fight and they're fighting they've been fighting you know with less of the people like canada has sent a lot of stuff over to them and other countries but they've mm -hmm. been fighting with not very much stuff there but that um that determination to protect one's country that determination to face the devil so to speak mm -hmm. uh, and we've also got to remember the soldiers they're facing have been told a, a bill of lies as well you mm -hmm. know from the leader and then they discover this isn't really what we've been told but they're sacrificing their lives for it um it does change a person quite considerably so when you were doing your book you know you you're capturing that story there but does it take it into the aftermath um to a certain extent yes i mean i i there were there's some you know i try to write from a narrative perspective so it's it's character driven so to speak mm -hmm. and so there's certainly this aspect of i you know picking several characters and then using their experiences to kind of tell the story and take the reader through that history and certainly you want to then tie that out with well what happened to this individual mm. after the war was over and you know and i went purposely with a wide range of experiences there were certainly those guys that came back and uh just kind of put their head down and 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 kept walking and and you know living their life and and dealing with things the best way they could there were guys that became alcoholics mm -hmm. uh some of whom who managed to come out of that some of whom sadly who didn't you know there were uh suicides mm -hmm. and um you know some some ended up in jail you know, so it was a wide, a wide, a wide range of experiences. And I, one of the most poignant things, though, was I, I got a couple photos of guys before the war and after the war. And it was interesting to just, you know, we've seen here in America, we typically see like pictures of the president before they entered office and then yes. after they entered, yes. you know, and how much their hair has changed <laughs> and yeah. how many wrinkles they have. Well, it yeah. was very similar with these guys. You mm -hmm. know, I looked at General Swing, who was the, the commander of the of the Angels. And just within two years, you know, yeah. his his demeanor, he looked, you know, 10, 15 years older. And so you well, could just I mean, see that their life is being on speed, even if they're yeah. sitting around waiting waiting to go up to the front or whatever they're meant to do the again that kind of adrenaline and that anticipation that um you know um that wonder of will we make it what are we up against you you can't live in that state of psyche there was one young man i interviewed um who had said that he, he kept going back to iraq because mm. he he only felt in control when he was quote quote bit out of control when mm -hmm. it was in the unknown when that adrenaline was there because he didn't know how to drop that adrenaline when he got home until one of his other colleagues showed him yoga and that changed his life completely and right. you know does yoga for families where they can do yoga together and come back and be centered and find that space with them again but he said he kept going back because of that because that's the state that he was used to living in and he didn't know how else mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. well i think yeah there's there's that adrenaline aspect of it and then there's also just the the size of your world if you will right it's like i remember one time when i was when i was in the service sitting out in the rain and and, and this epiphany came up it's like everything i own in the world is soaking wet 
and it's not going to get dry anytime soon, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just that notion of, you know, when you're in World War II or in Afghanistan or in Iraq, everything in immediacy or worth worrying about is almost literally within arm's reach of you. Right. Right. It's it's a very small, you're not worried about the phone bill. You're yes. not worried about electricity. You're not worried about refueling the car. You know, all of these things that we kind of tend to future worry about, if you will, like what's going to happen if in, in a combat zone, that all becomes very narrowed, narrowed kind of mm. focus, which in a way is kind of a weird sense of freedom, yeah. right? Because you don't have that uh, exist <laughs> existential is not the right word, but you know, you don't have those other, those, those, yeah. those little stresses. Now, of course you've got the big stresses, mm -hmm. But, you know, you learn to manage those, or at least you learn, you think you're learning to manage yeah. those. And what you're really doing is car, car, compartmentalizing it. Yeah. But it is an interesting dichotomy, right, of how um, those two different worldviews exist in a combat zone and out of a combat zone. And just the different sense of, of, of freedom that comes with that. And I, I should put the freedom in air quotes there. but Yes, you know. yes. You know, what kind of freedom? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and when you look at your World War II or even the Vietnam um, soldiers um, or the Korean War, when they came back, it was still something that not really talked about. You know, they didn't really mm -hmm. have that kind of support, talk about it. My dad died at 45, of, you know, of heart attack. He had the first one at 40. And a great deal of that was still carrying the war because it was mm -hmm. the stiff upper lip man, get on with life, British, of course. And there was no dealing with the demons or, you know, out of his squadron, there were two left. One sat down one day and said, I'm tired and dropped dead. And my dad was the last one and he was dead at 45, right? Mm -hmm. So there was none of that support, which we are realizing so much more now. I mean, the government can only do so much. And this is what I take my hat off to the veterans I've interviewed because they realized what they needed and they created it. They mm -hmm. created what they need. So it's support for other veterans who are needing it um, because that's the proactiveness of, of, a, of a veteran, right? Mm -hmm. they, when you're out there on combat, you know what you need. And if you can make it happen, you're going to make it happen. And they still bring that mindset right. back. Well, we need yeah. this. This is something. Well, let's let's uh, start an organization and make it happen. And yeah. they bring that that diligence, that duty, and that focus into something and producing something that's very productive. Yeah, that's a great observation. I, I I didn't really quite put it together that way. But what I did, you know, I did see similar behavior in that there was a lot of veterans organizations after mm -hmm. World War II. But to your point, or what I've seen is it was very personality driven. So meaning mm -hmm. that if you were in a unit that had a guy who came back and got a bee in his bonnet to set up an association that then ran reunions, then that's what happened, right? Mm -hmm. But for, for every unit that did that, there were dozens of units that didn't do that, yeah. right? And these guys didn't have that informal support network. Because I don't, I don't think, at least from the World War II perspective, they didn't necessarily go into it with that mindset of uh, a support channel it was more around it's like hey i'd like to see my buddies again and yeah. then it organically turned into yeah what you've described right mm -hmm. um but it's sad because that's you know those associations were really what helped keep the history of some of those units yeah. alive and what i've learned from my own archival research it just you know they were more uncommon than they were common unfortunately and also i mean they, they weren't encouraged to talk about it i mean I was only 11 when my dad died, and but we were just beginning to form a relationship. We were beginning to have conversations. And I remember talking to someone uh, who would have been around the same age as my dad some years later, who had also been a pilot. And I said, I wish my dad had spoken. And he said, but you have to understand to speak about it was to bring it back to life. And he mm -hmm. didn't know if he could cope with life in bringing that back to life. Right, right. Yeah, I can I can imagine it's it's exactly and then and then when you know you typically at least from the World War II generation they just when they want to when they tell the stories they tell all the funny stories like yes like the, that watch story that I mentioned or yeah. other things like that 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 help keep the levity of of those those memories up rather than going down the dark rabbit holes. Yeah, I mean I'm sure they do when it takes them there. It's not right. a choice, right. uh, but I think the only people that can understand that at that time is another veteran, 
And that's mm -hmm. why, the, you know, just like AA, Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous, you go to somebody else who's been through it because they understand. And I, you know, the same with rape victims or other victims of crime. You go to people who have been there because they understand what you're going through and they know what you need. And this is why, you know, when veterans support other veterans, it is for that reason. They understand. They understand, which yeah. is important. That's so right. tell us about the Four Hours of Fury, that book. Um, that sounds... Yeah, so Four Hours of Fury, it's a similar concept in that it's a narrative, you know, character-driven nonfiction account. Um, this, this, That book takes place in Europe. Um, towards the end of the war. So in, in March of 1945, the Allies were pushing their way into Germany and had come up against uh, the Rhine River, which is the largest river in, in Europe. And um, as part of that, they dropped two airborne divisions. So, you know, another paratrooper story, um, two airborne divisions on the far side of the Rhine, the British 6th Airborne Division and the American 17th Airborne Division. And Four Hours of Fury is about the American experience of that operation. And it was, the title gets its name from, um, it took about four hours for, so the, the, and this is another thing that's just hard to imagine today, but if you were standing, you know, out on, in front of your house and the first aircraft came over carrying the first paratrooper, it would have taken over four hours for the last plane wow. that was carrying, uh, pulling gliders and, and supplies to pass that point. So the whole air How many paratroopers were there? Uh, all told between the British and the Americans, including gliders, uh, around 19,000 wow. um, guys were dropped in in that period of four hours. And so... Um, Which, of course, of, they had to do, right? You have the element of surprise has a small window. That's right. right. That's Before right. the word gets out. So, you know, it has to be coordinated, you know, at that particular time in a short period of time to be efficient, to be to be productive. Otherwise, they're down before they're down, so to speak. That's right. That's right. And it incorporated all the lessons learned from previous operations. And you just described that, you know, you've you know, it behooves you to get everybody in in the single mm -hmm. lift so that you're then not exposing additional aircraft later on, because to your point, then the. The Germans they're being warned. Case, you know, mm -hmm. they've, yeah. they're switched on to what's happening. Yeah. You know, again, it's uh, we don't know how capable we are until we're put in a situation that we have to do something. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and this is actually one of the incredible things about humanity. You know, we very often sell ourselves short and we're actually incredible creatures with so many abilities when given the opportunity. And very often that opportunity, when it's in, you know, it becomes a life endeavor, it becomes a situation I have to, or, you know, this is going to happen. It uh, it really switches on those skills and those abilities that we didn't know we had. And I think, again, when we put it along with our, our instincts, our intuitiveness, I call it the, the wisdom, when we put it in hand in hand with that, uh, and we just go and do, we look back on it and go, God, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know that was even yeah. possible. And I so there's many, many a, a soldier out there that I'm sure, you know, at the end of the day, A, surprised they're still alive, but also surprised at just what they've just done. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the interesting lessons is also is what, what we can do. Yes. When, you know, unfortunately in a situation of conflict is when that typically comes comes together right but mm -hmm. to your point it's like well we do this or this happens and i think that you know that's one of the things that i always take inspiration from from world war ii in particular is this notion of you see many nations coming together and for a united purpose and of course there were disagreements along the way mm -hmm. and there were personality conflicts and you have to you know i think it's important to highlight those so that you don't we don't develop this glossy sense of well, that was then and this is now. And we we look at that as an alien experience and something that can't be replicated because it very much can be replicated if we approach things from this perspective of, well, this is this is about something bigger than you and bigger than me. So how are we going to actually work together to figure this out? And I think that's, you know, not to keep bringing it back to, to modern day, but if you want to look at lessons, that's how you kind of compare and contrast yes. things. I think well, we're losing that ability. We're to... losing that. And what's happening is things like Nazism is becoming sexy. 
It's it's yeah. raising because people don't truly understand the story behind it. They just think it's white power. And yeah. this is because it's not been taught in schools or it's been taught boringly in schools. And, right. it, and you know, a kid doesn't have interest in grandpa's war. You know, they're, they're too busy being on Twitter or TikTok or something else. And it's like, how do you be, have them get interested in the history of yesterday so we do not repeat what we should not mm -hmm. repeat today how do we educate them uh, to the sacrifices that were made for their freedom today uh, their appreciation of what their grandparents or their parents have gone through um, and to make sure that they read the signs i've had numerous people on and saying you know that these people are in their 80s and saying i am or 70s and saying i am seeing the same signs at a guy from china who lives in America now, and he says all of the rise of you know of China, um, and what went on there. I am seeing the same, the same systems happening now, and nobody's paying attention, because we don't right. pay attention because we don't look to the past as a guidance system, of what does work and what should not work. Right. Yeah, I agree, and I think you know I. I'll get up my soapbox here for a second, but it's like, you know, if you, if you, if you water things down, right. If you, if you make it to where you can't show pictures of the Holocaust, right. Footage of the Holocaust, because it's going to hurt somebody's feelings, then you're, you're, you're going to water down the lessons and the message that you're trying to impart upon yeah. where we've been, where we don't want to go again. Right. And exactly. that's, I understand trying to get a balance there, but I'd rather err on the side of showing the realities of what the world can devolve into so that we're all aware of what we don't want to have happen again. Exactly. I mean, things like um, 1917, the movie, you mm -hmm. know, where, that when you look at uh, how many people were just in the mud trenches, how many people they got mold on the feet and, you know, so, you know, the, the bodies deteriorated before they even kind of got, to shoot anyone you know because mm -hmm. and then you looked at the the german ones that they had abandoned and how you know clean and pristine and everything else that it was it's an excellent movie um but then you look at the band of brothers which i liked about that movie again was not so much the you know the war aspect of it for me it's always about the um the mental approach to uh, to um survival uh, mm -hmm. again what are people capable of what overcomes them that they lose themselves or how do they come together to support one another or if they're isolated you know how do they kind of bring all the people that have been with them with them where you know even if they're right. not there to help them move forward so i'm always interested in the psychological approach mm -hmm. to all of these things because i think if we don't learn from this we repeat it but we don't repeat the good we repeat the bad and we're very much right. seeing that at the present moment all right, yeah. because let's face it, you know, back in in many of the wars, even Iraq or anything, when it first started, we didn't have the internet. Now we have the internet, and you have the gaming system which glorifies war, and you have movies and things that glorifies war without really giving the nitty gritty. Back in the nineties, mm -hmm. things like you did have Band of Brothers, you did have um, uh, Finding Private Ryan, you did have um, Schindler's List. You had those movies that got into the nitty gritty of what really went on. But where is that now? Because people are wanting the Top Gun, great movie, but they're mm -hmm. wanting the sensationalism rather than the nitty gritty that if we are not careful, we are going to repeat. Right. So we need to get people reading your books. We need to get people understanding the history. <laughs> and, you know, you're, you're talking about what you understand. You're a parachuter. So you're going for the parachuter stories, which, again, how often do we hear about that? They're kind of maybe incorporated in the story, but not targeted as a story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think um, for my ex-husband's 50th birthday, I took him blindfold to the airfield and then I announced that he was about to jump out of a plane at 10,000 feet <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and he had such an adrenaline rush that I felt mm -hmm. it gave him a new sense of renewal of life mm -hmm. right and which it did um he actually did say to me have you increased the insurance <laughs> 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 but it's a uh, you know I can understand why the people do it for fun 
And of course, some people, you know, do it for various reasons. And of course, you've got the parachuters that jump in for rescue, rescuing right. people, all of that. I mean, we've got to realize every time they jump from a plane, however skilled they are, things can still go wrong. Absolutely. Very easily. Yeah. Yeah. So as yeah, you said, the commute to work, I like that. <laughs> it's because they get to work to when work. they go to the ground. <laughs> but it's uh, it's that journey. I and mean, I mean, it could be just as hazardous as driving on any highway. <laughs> in, right. In, right. But it's uh, it's up to the elements. A gust of wind, right? Um, or a lack of wind or whatever the case is. But um, Right. It's very easy to snap an ankle, a leg, yes. or, or worse, right? Yes, fall the wrong way. Yes, fall into something that you shouldn't yeah. be falling into. Uh, being seen, of course, if it's wartime. But yes, so many different things there. That, so I'm glad that you're focusing on the paratroopers because, again, their story is not much told. But also the lightheartedness as everybody getting their ears pierced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, to get guys at that time period to actually agree to pierce their ears. I, I know. What were they again, drinking? Just, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those great stories that kind of, again, you know, brings us back to the realities of, yeah, the greatest generation, sure. Yes. But they were all 18 at some point and made silly, you know, decisions yeah. just like everybody else did. And they all had to grow up very, very quickly when they got there out in the front line. That's right. right. In many Nothing ways, that said. youth was stolen from them uh, because of that. And so we've got to remember that. But I think this, um, I'm all for not repeating the negative parts of history. And the only way we're going to do that is to be aware of what went on, how to prevent us repeating it. And, you mm -hmm. know, what we're seeing in the world right now is, you know, I call it resistance is futile. The, the change is already happening. The consciousness is already rising. We're already moving away from that. But you've got the people that are still trying to hold on tight to that control, the the restrictions of what people can read or, or what women can do or, you know, anybody. There's this whole thing. It's resistance is futile. We're mm -hmm. already so far ahead. You can protest as much as you like, and there will be a revolution because of that. They won't win because life moves on. And quite essentially, we've moved on without them, and they're not learning from history. If we learn from history, then we know how to recognize the negatives and make sure that we steer it in the wrong direction before it takes over. And that's up to us, isn't it? It's up to us. I agree. I agree. Um, uh, I would add to that, but I think you said it perfectly. I mean, I'm, <laughs> you know, I I kind of dedicate my my career to to telling those stories and trying to open as many eyes to those experiences as possible. My brother is an author, but he did a fascinating book. And it was Thomas D, uh, The Repercussions of Thomas D. And it's a young boy on a phone talking to his girlfriend and he goes through a wormhole and he's in 1942 um on bombing and they arrest him because he's got this funny machine or whatever and he ends up talking to this guy about the future unknown that this guy actually was a double agent and because of it it changed the war a hundred percent and the germans won and oh, how wow. life was now and uh, it's quite interesting because his whole vision of what life would have been like if germany had taken over mm -hmm. and uh you know like no cell phones for you, no freedom for you in the future, guys. <laughs> Can you imagine right. telling the youth today, no cell phones, no internet, no, no, you know, what's name watches, uh, none of that, <laughs> no freedom. Can you right. imagine? They'll go have a conniption. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but I do think we need to shake them up a little bit and go, don't be so complacent in your freedom right now. It is slowly being taken away from you by extremists that uh, want to take you backwards. Uh, so we have to take some responsibility for our own actions and our own awareness. And that means know your history to know your present to change the future. That's right. And also to realize that, you know, we have it pretty good. Yes. And to not take that for granted. Right. I think that's that's the other, you know, that you're your word complacency speaks exactly to yes. that, right? We've, we've got it so good that it's easy to take it for granted. And I think that... Um, well, that's what people... COVID was all about. It was that shakeup to, to show us what yeah. really is important. And that was togetherness, you know, each other. 
right? Re reaching out to each other. It was a great redirect for that to show us what's important in life. Yeah. But many people learned that lesson and pivoted because of it. Other people just complained about it right. and went the other way. And, you know, again, that is the choice in life, isn't it? Just as somebody on the front, am I going to listen to my superior? Am I going to listen to the rest of my comrades here? Are we going to work together as one unit? Or am I going to go off and do what I want to do because I feel like it? Right. See how far that gets you. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was just about to say. See how that works out. <laughs> and the thing is that same mentality of that camaraderie, um, I think that we should have that in our everyday lives. We should have our brothers and sisters that that is our tribe that we have each other's back and we're there to support each other. And I think that's something that's very much missing. And it isn't one tribe against the other. It is that this is your right. orchestra with your players and they're going to play this music and another orchestra will play something else. It doesn't mean you're mortal enemies. It just means you're playing different tunes in life. But respect. <laughs> yeah, if you could put that in a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yes, I'd love to sell that. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> So do you have another book coming up? Um, uh, so right now I'm focused on Angels Against the Sun and just trying to get, um, you know, share that story with as many people as possible. And then in uh, the spare time, I am I'm putting together a list of ideas for my next book. I still haven't quite landed on it yet. It'll probably be another World War II or World War II era story, but still still trying to piece that together. I mean, it was an incredible era when when you looked at the the integrity of the era of how people mm -hmm. went into it um it was very much about each other rather than being about self mm -hmm. and that so many people reliant on you and vice versa and it was about having each other's backs but also in the best way possible, having as much dignity, mm -hmm. right? And that dignity, I think, was something that they tried to hold on to the best they can, no matter what they were facing, because without that, kind of they lost their own grace. Right. And I think that, that I think that's a great way to, to look at it, because without that, without trying to maintain that, it's very easy to devolve to the lowest common denominator, yes. right? And that's yes. uh, something that you really have to struggle against when you're in an environment where basically you can do anything you want. Right. Which, you know, again, there's lots of movies out there where you've got the kind of, you know, Rambo type person. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I look at some of these movies and I think, okay, how many bodies have they just dropped? And like, and it and it has had no conscience on him. Oh, how many times has his head been hit and he has no concussion? Right. <laughs> how many yeah. times has he been shot, but he keeps getting back up? <laughs> and it's so unreal, but it sends the wrong message. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is you can get shot once out there and not make it out. This is not get back up and just take everybody out. Um, so it's, yeah, it's enjoy your fantasy but please understand it's a fantasy and read about the reality that's i agree 100 percent. that's right a 47 cent bullet can take out anybody exactly so where do people find the books also where do they find you sure yeah both books um, are available on amazon or at uh, barnes and noble and many of them uh, many independent books stores carry them as well the new one angels against the sun comes out April 18th. So it's available for pre-order right now on, mm -hmm. on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, but it will be on shelves um, middle of next month. And then um, people can find me. I'm on, uh, I'm on all the social media channels, somewhat uh, against my will sometimes, but um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm on Resistance Instagram. Is as, futile. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, I have a love hate relationship with it for reasons <laughs> that you're probably familiar with yourself, yeah. but uh yeah, I'm on Twitter and uh, I've got an author page on Facebook where I do a lot of updates and share information on um, and uh, same same with Twitter. Okay, and your and website? A, yes, I do. Thank you for bringing, reminding me. I've got uh, jamesfenelon.com. Can you spell my, that out for the people who are just listening? Sure, James, and then the last name is spelled Fenelon, F as in Frank, E-N-E-L-O-N, -E and dot com, all one, all one word there. 
and uh, the Twitter would be James Fenelon and uh, the same on Instagram and Facebook. That's uh, right. And uh, um, of course, you can just put in your name here at uh, selfdiscoverywisdom.com and uh, your whole show page comes up here with all of the avenues that they can listen you uh, listen to the show on and, uh, and also find the books and all the links and everything else. I love that you've taken this topic and... Uh, you know, not only kind of the parachuters, but just um, just the way that, you know, it's we don't hear about parachuters, but it's just, it's keeping that history alive without over-glamorizing, you know, bringing up the humor, bringing up the reality, bringing up how it actually affects people. Uh, and a reminder, you know, I remember, you know, after 9-11, all these people wanting to go to war, wanted to take out the enemy. And then these people then came back and go, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. It's not mm -hmm. like the game or the movies. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it shakes a lot. When you have to take somebody else's life, even if it's in defense of your own or defense of your country or other people, it is not something you take lightly. It is something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And I think people need to understand that, right? Let's try and avoid war. Let's try listening and learning. Let's really respect each other's differences. But I think if we step into kindness, that little word of being kind and respectful towards each other instead of combative, we would actually have a much better world to live in. I agree, Sarah. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk about it with you today and and share those experiences, both from your interviews with veterans and 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 the stories that I've collected from from World War II. They're incredible people who are there to show us actually how to live, because mm -hmm. they've really been through the strongest adversity and difficulties. And even though they may have challenges today that keep popping up, uh, the desire to live as they fought. Um, and and as a collective, to be there for each other is exemplary. And I think there's a lot to learn from them. I agree. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us uh, today. So it's jamesfenelon.com. Reach out to him there. Amazon, uh, you can find both books there. I hope you come back when you do write the next one and share that with us. And, uh, you know, keep on keep on sharing those parachute paratroopers because we just don't see enough of, of, about their stories and you know it's taking the life in their hands just jumping out of a plane never mind what else <laughs> that they're doing right so thank you so much for sharing with us Out outstanding thank you so much for your time my pleasure and to everyone else out there please get these books and maybe read them as a family have a conversation about it if you've got teens or young people you know, if they don't know what went on in the past and the struggles that people went through in the past, how are you preparing them for the future? Make this something that you do as a family and have a conversation about it. Not everything is this glamorous game and I killed 100 people, I scored today. It's not about that. Show them the real value of life and the sacrifices that other people have made. We hope that you enjoyed day. the show. Until next time. There are so many more for you here on selfdiscoverywisdom.com. Just go to the podcast tag at the top there and you will see all the many genres and all 3,000 shows ready for your listening. We are here to serve you, to help you on your journey of life. And we know that through inspiration, it begets invitation. We are supported by you, the listeners, and those that we interview. Anything that you can spare us in donation would be greatly accepted. And we do hope that you enjoy the next show.